Last week, we talked about, you know, telling a story and how to present your work in a meaningful way. Uh, this week, we're going to talk about how we can visually display your work or showcase your work. Um, if people are curious about that Kremble coffee mug in my presentation, that's how it looks. Really cool, really well designed. Um, I didn't design it. It was before my time. But anyways, let's get started. Uh, my first slide here. So why infographics? Um, graphics are one of the easiest ways to convey um, information visually, right? So we can create um, you know, strong visuals that relate to our work. Uh, you may have seen some of our graphics uh, on Twitter, on Instagram. Here are some examples of them. And there are different types of graphics that will do different types of things. You can have graphics that uh, tell a story, graphics that offer tips and tutorials, or something that's just visually impacting that's going to explain your work or explain your research that everyone can understand. So we'll talk about how we sort of, uh, the, the tools we use to create graphics. For me, uh, I use Adobe Creative Cloud. Um, I'm not sure if all labs have access to this or if all PIs have access to this, but some of these apps include Illustrator, Photoshop, InDesign, and these are really designer tools that a lot of graphic artists will use. There is a steep learning curve to these tools, but if you spend anywhere from you know one day to a week, I'm sure you can understand the basics of it and get started and get going. And there are tons of tutorials on YouTube that can help you with that. Uh, some other tools that are a bit more easy to sort of grasp is the Microsoft Office applications. You can create graphics in PowerPoint. Uh, in you know Microsoft Word. If you've seen any of Kevin Smith's graphics, those are all created by Ingrid and Public Affairs and she uses PowerPoint and they look wonderful. So uh, you can create powerful graphics using just the Microsoft applications that you already have on your workstations. There are other applications as well. Canva is a free application as well as there are a few others that I'll list towards the end of the presentation that you can use. If you fancy coding and you love to code your graphics or you know coding really well and you'd say you use R, the program R, uh, there's R Waffle which will help you create graphics uh, or uh, Graphics Pi for Python. So you can use those things to create graphics and I feel that may be a bit easier for um, researchers or PIs that love to work with data sets that uh, are complex and you can translate that into a code and have that displayed visually. So the next step to create your graphics are going to be outlining your goals. So essentially, you know, you want to ask yourself, what is a burning problem in your field? Essentially, it's, it's what your research paper is going to address, right? Um, and then you're going to have a bunch of supporting questions for that burning problem. And then you'll have some probing questions, you know, some data related probing questions. In a sense, we can sort of think of this as a visual essay. Uh, where you have your large scale problem, the supporting questions and the probing questions can all be graphics that answer this large scale problem and sort of tell this story, which um, is sort of, I guess, an easier way to sort of break it down and, and not overcomplicate it. So let's look at an example of how we can sort of break this pyramid down to, to help you um, create graphics for whatever it is that you want to. So here's an example. Um, the large scale problem, of course, COVID right now is a big thing. So let's say our big problem is like, how do we create a vaccine for SARS-CoV-2, which is the, the virus that um, leads to COVID-19. You can have a subset of supporting questions here, you know, and all of these could be a graphic. You know, what is the cost of a vaccine? You can illustrate that very easily using money signs or any sort of pharmaceutical type graphic. Uh, which countries are involved? You can display a map how many pharmaceuticals are involved. You can show simple graphics, you know, using buildings. And then you can, add, you can get a bit more specific and ask how many clinical trials are there? Do companies specialize in infectious diseases? All of these questions are able to be displayed visually and sort of tell the story of how you can create a vaccine. And in a sense, creating a graphic like this can sort of be an easy way for someone who knows nothing about you know, the coronavirus vaccine uh, to someone that can be more educated about the topic. And, and that's done really easily by sort of answering these questions. So in a sense, say you've got your research question. Now you've got all your supporting questions, your probing questions. What's the next step? The next step is to visualize your data. 
Now, I know in research, we, we have a ton of tools to visualize our data. You know, we've got, you know, microRNA plots. We've got, you know, your regular bar graphs um, and everything in between that. But there are different ways that we can look at it. This is not going to be an exhaustive list of all the types of visuals that we could create. But here are some examples to help you guide along um, and to consider with what data you can use these visuals with. So the first one is informative visuals. These visuals really uh, are used to convey important data. They don't require much context. So if someone doesn't know uh, anything about a topic, they can sort of really understand what's going on. The simplest way to explain some of that data are in donut charts or pictograms. So an example of this would be something like this, a donut chart showing a percentage of something. Um, in this case, I've got a graphic of, you know, the percentage of Canadians that believe scientific evidence should influence government decisions when it comes to COVID, right? That's easy to understand. We have an understanding of what, you know, the Canadian population believes with this graphic. Um, and, you know, you don't need much context with that information. The second graphic on the right, is also easy to understand, right? It's um, everyone loves Tim Hortons and their double doubles, I know I do. Uh, and you can sort of draw a comparison here. The graphic on the right is, is particularly interesting because it's relatable to uh, you know, a certain population, in this case, Canadians and their coffee, but also you know, you're taking something that's relevant, which is the SARS-CoV-2 you know, vaccine, and you're translating into something that's relatable, right? So with your research, try and think of ways that you can relate that to your jet to a larger audience you know in this case i've chosen to go with with coffee now, of course you know sars cov is very relevant to us today but um you can sort of find ways to make your um make your topic relevant and relatable to a larger audience and that's sort of what these informative visuals will do and sort of help you tell your story and sort of hook your audience in a way uh, to learn more about what you're researching the next type of visual are comparative visuals. So it, with this type of visual, you're, you're, you're showing similarities or differences. Um, in this case, it could be, you know, parts of a whole or independent variables. Um, the example I chose to show was, was sort of bar charts, you know, or bubble charts. And you'll see that in the next slide. In this case, I've chosen, I've made all these numbers up, so don't quote me on any of this, but uh, in this case, I've chosen to show funding over time. This could have, could have easily been a uh, scatter plot or a, a line graph. Um, but in this case, I've chosen to do a bar chart. And these are also easily created. You can use Excel, you can use Microsoft Word, um, and, and you can show differences um, with independent variables and make it easy for someone to understand. I know in research, bar charts are absolutely uh, important. We show that in showing differences in different states uh, when we're doing our experiments. And of course, those have the error bars and things like that. Um, that's great for research papers, but you know you don't necessarily have to show that in a in a visual. You want to show what's you know relevant, what's important, and what's going to grab your uh, viewers' attention um, in the shortest amount of time. The next type of visual is going to be changes over time. So you can show changes over time and space. Um, you know you can sort of use this as a sort of line graph as well, but I like to think of this as like a roadmap or sort of a flowchart or a timeline. Um, you can also show density and spatial data using choropleth uh, graphs as well, and I'll show an example of that. So in, this, in the next visual uh, that I have is, is a timeline. So in this case, I've, I've chosen exactly what I've built on in the past, uh, the previous few slides, is a timeline for vaccine. This, this visual is straightforward to understand. Um, it's colorful, so it grabs your attention. And you can follow along reading each step of the way because it's organized in that manner. So from a research perspective, um, say you study neurons. Um, my background is in neuroscience, so that's why I'm going with this example here. And you wanted to show how a neuron develops into a full brain cell, for example. You could use something like this to show each step of the way. You can show a neural progenitor cell. You can show a cycling cell. In between, you can show all the transcription factors that are involved and things like that, right? So in that sense, you know, maybe within a presentation or even your research paper, you could have something that's visually captivating that shows 
progression over time um, and use these wonderful you know, colors and things like that to um, show those changes. Spatial density and spatial data uh, are choropleth maps. Um, I'm not sure how relevant this would be, but I thought I'd just put in the example um, for, for visual explanation. It shows density based on different types of shading and different types of, um, uh, I guess, color, uh, I guess, hues and tones. Uh, so in this case, it shows, you know, the darker color means there's a higher density of whatever that variable is. In this visual, it's the number of um, COVID-19 cases. And uh, if you look, you can definitely see Montreal being hit the hard, hardest there and then the other areas of Canada that are affected. So I know ArcGIS is a program that is very useful to generate this type of data if it's relevant to your research. Um, that also does have a steep learning curve, but uh, you can also do this manually by coloring in charts and vectors of, of maps in different programs as well. The next type of visual are organizational visuals. Uh, organizational visuals are great for showing groups, patterns, ranks, or orders. You can even use a table if you'd like, but your table doesn't have to be a direct export from you know, Microsoft Excel. You can definitely make your tables interesting with colors, um, you know, highlighting certain cells and things like that to draw attention and focus to those tables. Uh, Venn diagrams are great as well. Um, or even mind maps. So in the next example, I have a Venn diagram and it's very easy to understand because you look at two things that are of concern and things that are you know, independent to each and things that are similar to, to each one here. So in this case, we're starting the economy and public health and well-being. a vaccine is definitely going to be a, a common thing. If I wanted to turn this into a mind map, I could have the word vaccine in the center and show all the things related to the vaccine. And from those things, you can show all the other sub steps that are required. Um, in this case, it's pretty straightforward. You could look at similarities and differences. If I go back to my neuron example, I could show the differences between a neuron and an astrocyte, and I can show all the transcription factors of each and the ones that are similar, the ones that are different, and really showcase to someone who knows nothing about neurons and astrocytes what makes them unique. Right. So things like that, which are a bit easier to understand than, say, you know, a microarray heat map um, could be very beneficial for people that don't have any knowledge within neuroscience or anything like that. The next type of visual is revealing relationships. So uh, this is basically what scientists do all the time. We reveal relationships uh, between variables and between different states and you know, in your experiments and whatever you're, you're doing. The data is complex. You know, you've got multivariable plots and things like that. Uh, the visuals don't have to be. It can be, you can, you sort of take those visuals and break them down into something simple and digestible and ensure that all your, your points and plots are labeled so that people can understand and draw their own conclusions. So in the next sort of visual, an example would be a multi-series plot like this, where we're talking about vaccine effectiveness and depending on how effective the vaccine is, we can look at the number of new cases over time, right? So in this case, I'm making up these numbers. I just created this visual for the purpose of this presentation, right? We can draw inferences that if we have a vaccine that's only 10% effective, we're likely to get more cases because it's not gonna be as great. Um, and you can use this with, with your data as well. You can, you can show changes over time, um, you know, based on, on, on your data set and, and if it suits um, your, your data, right? Um, a lot of these are pretty straightforward to create in Excel, uh, Microsoft Word. And, you know, I created this in Illustrator because I'm used to that program, but um, even in R or Python, graphic uh, graphing tools are available for you to create stuff like this that can be visually interesting than just a black and white kind of multi-series plot. Uh, the next type of visual uh, are explorative visuals. Uh, now these ones are a bit challenging to create because they are interactive. And I, I think you would definitely require some, some of programming and maybe there's people within your lab and your research group that are, have that, have that, um, uh, have that skill set to create these types of visuals. 
And what you can do, I don't really have an example of this because it, it's hard to create and I, I really didn't have the time to create one, but uh, interactive visuals, say you, you show a map of, um, or you show a brain region, let's say, and you want to show what type of cells are associated with that brain region. And people can say, click on that brain region and it expands up and you can show all the types of cells. And then, you know, you click on that cell and it gets the properties of that cell and, and that sort of stuff. Um, these are really, really interesting because what happens is people can generate their own conclusions uh, and people can and sort of make their own, you know, uh, inferences and things like that with this type of visual. Uh, they're, they're, like I said, they're a bit challenging to create, but I think out of all the other ones could offer the most impact if done correctly. Uh, but like I said, uh, I don't have an example of this just because it's a bit challenging to create. So those are six uh, sort of data types of uh, graphics that you can create with your data. Of course, it's not uh, an exhaustive list of, of, of uh, graphics that you could create. There are tons of other graphics that you can create. Um, also, you know, some of these graphics may overlap, you know, comparative and organizational. You might find that a bar graph does both or, um, you know, a table does both uh, to, to showcase some of these things. Um, and after you've sort of visualized your data, the next step is to sort of lay it out. You know, how do you want to lay out your data? And this comes down to, um, you know, a, a bit of design. You know, you you've kind of have to, to look at it from, I guess, an artistic point of view. How do you want things to flow? You definitely want to create something that's visually appealing, you know, whether you're using graphics or whether you're using, you know, flow charts or whatever it may be. You want things to flow in such a way that your viewer's eyes are led to the final conclusion. And that final conclusion is basically, in a way, the payoff and you know, what you want your viewer to learn from your graphic. Um, one thing to keep in mind is color theory. I say this because um, colors play such a big role in how long people keep their attention on things. If something doesn't look visually attractive, chances are people are not going to spend a lot of time on it. So color theory and understanding color theory um, is pretty straightforward because, you know, it talks about analogous colors. It talks about uh, contrasting colors and how you can use those to really um, differentiate uh, your graphics from, say, something that, that doesn't use a lot of color theory. And, and these principles are important uh, because, like I said, you will, you will definitely have more eyes on your presentation, your poster, your graphic uh, when it comes down to it. The second point I want to make is brand guidelines. So as part of Kremble, we do have a brand guideline, which I'm happy to share with the PIs and the labs. And this basically outlines the color schemes that we use, you know, the secondary colors and things like that. And, and that's really important because say you're giving a presentation outside of Kremble, you know, the goal is for people to recognize like, oh yeah, that's from Kremble. I recognize this visual from Kremble because of, you know, the, because of the brand that's associated with it, the color palettes, the font, the text, and things like that. Um, it can be a bit tricky because I know we've all got our own creative flares and taste, but if you're doing, I would say, Kremble branded work or a Kremble branded presentation, the brand guidelines are there to, to help you to make it look cohesive um, and visually appealing for, for your audience. The next thing is visual flow and story flow. So visually, you want your viewer's eyes to sort of run through the graphic in an organized way, and it, it's sort of calculated based on your design choices, right? So you start off with whatever your initial graphic is to, to hook your, your, your audience, um, and their eyes track down to learn more details about that question, that burning problem that your graphic is trying to answer. And this also translates to story flow, because in a sense, you're telling a visual story. In a way, it is you know, a visual essay, and you want that to convey through your graphics. Um, and last one, appropriate color palette. It apply, it's sort of redundant. I forgot to delete that line, actually. So just ensure you're using the right colors. Um, ensure you're using colors that make sense, nothing too crazy or vibrant. Of course, unless the presentation warrants that. Um, for us in science, you know, we've got a lot of complex data already. We don't want to overwhelm 
people with complex visuals and complex colors that absolutely turn them off to um, whatever it is that you're trying to present. Uh, so here's an example of information flow. This graphic is quite busy. Of course, there's a lot of information here, but I chose to go with a circle to organize uh, the information because in a way it leaves your eye in a circular motion. So if you did happen to miss something from one of the subheadings, your eyes kind of go back to that, uh, that, that subheading or that text from that subheading. Uh, I use different colors, right? Different colors because there are different sections and we wanna separate those sections because they all mean different things. Um, and all the colors that you see here are actually Kremble colors, right? Um, it's part of our brand guidelines. And if I'm ever creating a graphic, I 99% of the time, I'm sticking to the font, uh, the Kremble font and the Kremble colors that are outlined in the brand guidelines. Because when people see this on Twitter or on Instagram, they're like, oh yeah, that's from Kremble. And that's, just, that's ultimately the goal for a lot of my graphics um, in public affairs. And hopefully that'll be your goal as well. Be like, oh yeah, that's from you know, that lab at Kremble that does that type of research. Um, and that's sort of the way I wanna kind of convey the message and it, it, it ensures consistency as well. Um, the importance of visuals, I just want to sort of touch on this a bit, and, and the importance being that, um, you know, you want your research to go as far as possible and as wide as possible, uh, you know, and you want people not only in your field to understand, but people outside of your field, and, and that's, that's really the goal, and um, a line that sort of strikes me or sort of sticks with me is science isn't any good if it's sort of stuck in the lab, um, and your visuals are going to aid you in getting your science out of the lab because you can show that to your family that may not necessarily have a science background, your relatives, your friends, and they can see something that's visually appealing and be like, oh, that's really cool. I didn't know you're working on that. Or like, oh, that's really cool. Like that's the impact of your research and like, and they can see it visually. So um, don't underestimate the importance of visuals, uh, whether it be in your research paper or your presentations, because Donors, um, you know, people who are in the grant office might want to see things like that and things that are succinct, and visually appealing. So um, definitely look at putting some time into creating these visuals and designing them in such a way that you can clearly send your message about your research um, in, in, a, in a cool and, and visually appealing way. Um, so here's a bit of a summary, you know, the first step outline your goals, what is that burning problem in your field, and what are some supporting data-related questions that you can ask uh, that and you can generate you know, cool visuals for. And then you can visualize your data and you look at the types of ways you can explain your data. Now, like I said, it's on an exhaustive list. You have you know, informative visuals, comparative visuals, um, changes over time, organizational visuals, things that reveal relationships and explorative visuals. And then the last thing is to lay out your information. And this is where sort of the design and the artistic flair comes into, into play. Uh, and I hope that your labs, um, you know, if you have people that are artistic or if you're artistic yourself, you sort of take this as a, as a cool challenge. Be like, okay, how can I make this look as cool as possible? Um, and for some people that might excite them, for some people that might be a whole daunting task, but find a way to lay out your information uh, in a clean, succinct manner so that people, number one, aren't distracted and people have their eyes on your graphic and your visuals for a really long period of time so that you're able to, so they're eventually going to get to, you know, the payoff and the reason why you created that graphic, which is to explain your wonderful research. Okay, so... Here are a few design resources. Um, I'm happy to also put this into a Word document and then I can link each one. Um, Canva, Drawkit, Humans, Undraw, Open Peeps, Patterns, and Creative Boom are all websites that will uh, allow you to download vector images um, for free. Uh, I think you just have to create an account and you're able to, to download them. Um, just a quick word about vector versus I guess, regular images. The vector images are great because they preserve their detail. Um, you can scale them as big as you want, small as you want, and they won't distort, uh, which is really great if you're creating you know, for different mediums, whether it be social media, a PowerPoint presentation, um, or anything like that. 
and all these are, are vector-based images. Um, and then lastly, I have a final challenge for all, all the people in labs. Um, I want you to turn your research paper into an infographic. Um, I, I want you to identify a paper that's the most, that's been the most impactful in the last year or a couple of years or whatever it may be. And I want you to then go and plan, you know, use that pyramid, um, you know, your burning question, your supporting questions, your probing questions, plan that out, what you can really use in a visual, uh, and then visualize that data. What are some of the best ways to visualize that type of data, whether it be informative visuals, you know, bar graphs. Um, what I don't want to see is like five bar graphs and be like, here's my research paper. Um, change it up, you know, find different ways to explain your information. Uh, use, you know, diff use, use typography to your advantage too, you know, whether you're playing with font size and things like that. Um, and the last thing is, you know, your layout. How are you going to lay out your information? You know, how are you going to make it flow? And and for me, sometimes just drawing it out helps. You know, I take a piece of paper in my notebook, draw arrows. It was like, yes, this is the way my eye flows through all the visuals. And then I go in and create, you know, the visual. So I hope um, this sort of helps you and gives you some concrete examples of types of visuals, types of uh, things that you can create to tell the story of your research in a visual way. Uh, and I hope that you're able to maybe take the research that you're doing currently and turn that into infographics that you can share with not only scientists and, and people within your field, but people outside of your field that won't necessarily understand um, exactly what it is that you're doing. And that's gonna help you in the long run because more people are gonna know about your research, uh, more people are gonna be aware of your research and more people are gonna be um, you know, aware of the impact of your research. Um, so that's, that's kind of it for me, and I, and I hope this was helpful, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions and, and um, you know, concerns or anything like that. Great, thanks so much, Twain. That was wonderful. Um, we'll go through the chat feed now. Uh, one of the first questions was whether uh, the Adobe Creative Tools were available mm -hmm. from UHN, like 365. Um, I did respond in the chat there mm -hmm. that uh, the Photoshop and the InDesign that Twain is using is actually part of the Adobe Cloud package that was purchased uh, with a license. Um, so that is something that would have to be um, bought through UHN. It's an annual subscription, and I actually can't yep. remember the total cost. I'm not sure. Uh, if, I, your head. if you're, I don't know if UHN gets a corporate discount because if there is a corporate discount, I believe it is thirty dollars a month. Okay. Um, yeah. Or even a student discount, like if there are students within your labs that that may have or maybe into design that want to use that. I think it's 30 bucks a month, but double check on Adobe's website for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and I will note that because now instead of, you know, buying your box of software and loading it onto your computer, now it is available cloud-based. So you can actually access it through a browser from anywhere. So you only have to log in with your username and password and they usually allow two or three different devices to connect to it. So if you had it on your work computer and also at home, then you'd be able to have both of those signed in. Um, and I know for our office, we'll often have, you know, of course, Twain is the one that's using it primarily, but sometimes I'll log in and I can access it, you know, yeah. sort of periodically as well. Um, there are some other comments about uh, some of the software that you mm -hmm. have mentioned. So Krita, is that what it is? Um, and then there's also GIMP is another open source yep. image analysis design tool. Michael put that one in. Yeah. Uh, PictoChart got a little love yeah. here. Um, there are some questions about the brand guidelines that yeah. you mentioned. And sure. if there is... Um, uh, the RGB codes available for that. So yeah, I yeah, speak to that. yeah. So with the brand guidelines, actually, do I even have? Do I have it up? I might have it up here. I know you have the crumble blue memorized. <laughs> yeah, I do. Um, can you see that on my screen? Uh, not yet. I think the you have to highlight a different window. Oh, okay. Give me one second. Let me figure Still this. Still in out. your PowerPoint there. Um, I will just put this up on screen. So, 
So this is the Kreble brand guidelines and it's a wonderful document. Um, I'm not sure who created it, if it was Anna Narday's office, uh, but it goes through everything um, from the logo use, uh, from logo versions, how to use the logos correctly. Uh, if you need the Kremble logos, please email me and I'm happy to provide that for you as well if you wanna put that on presentations and things like that. Uh, so you can see here, you know, how to use it without taglines or with the UHN logo. And then the hex colors are all here and for different purposes. So you have, you know, Pantone coated, uh, which is for coated paper that have sort of a semi-gloss if you're doing a magazine for, you know, any reason. And then you have RGB, which is for web um, and, you know, the hex codes as well. If you want to print, paint your rooms and send this to Home Depot with crumble blue or something like that. So, um, and these are our secondary colors, which you kind of saw sprinkle throughout my presentation as well, which I like to use more than <laughs> um, I probably should, but um, it adds a little more flair. Uh, but these are the brand guidelines that I'm happy to also email out to, to people so that they, they have it as well and they can use it uh, for their own graphics and presentations. And within those brand guidelines, there's also the crumble fonts as well. Oh, yes. That right was uh, mentioned in the Yes, and there they are. Crumble fonts. Um, and you can actually, it's not typically included in, you know, your, your standard Microsoft Office, but you can download Myriad Pro through some free font sites like DaFont, D-A-F-O-N-T. Mm -hmm. um, and then there also is a UHN brand guidelines as well. So we can always include that as yep. part of our resources afterwards. Um, there's a question whether your slides will be available afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. I will put it into a PDF uh, for sure. Uh, there is one question. In your opinion, is it more visually appealing to have a white background with dark black lettering or a colored background with white appropriately colored lettering? Um, that comes down to personal preference. If, if the, you know, the color background isn't too distracting, um, then then sure. Uh, my personal preference is I love white backgrounds because um, say you've got a white image that you want to put onto your slides, then you're not worried about that sort of the background of that white image showing up on a colored background, right? Unless you're using an image that has a transparent background, which is a PNG file, um, then, you know, you might have some issues there where you're, you know, you, it won't look as clean, essentially, say, if you have an image that already has a background that's sort of baked in. Um, but like I said, that's a, that's a personal preference. And if, you know, if I think I sort of live by the mantra that if it doesn't look good to you, it may not look good to somebody else. And, and that's sort of how I go about things in, in certain situations. Um, and maybe you want to, you know, share, um, you know, a, a draft copy with a few people in your lab or whoever it is that you're showing it to be like, Hey, does this look good? And you hopefully get their honest opinion about it. Um, but like I said, it comes down to, to personal preference for that. And like I said, ask yourself, is it distracting? Um, and does it take away from my presentation? That's great. Thank you. Um, Michael has included a recommended YouTube video link there, uh, and he indicates that it answers many of your questions about presentation. So that's available to anyone there. Um, Karen Davis has said, thank you. This was fantastic. I love the challenge to labs. And so can you send around this presentation to all of the labs and trainees so that they can work on it? Yeah, for sure. For sure. I mean, maybe they, they'd like a break from diligently writing their manuscripts and they can create something, uh, um, visually cool, you know, to maybe accompany that manuscript that they're, they're writing. So absolutely. Yeah. We'll definitely send it around. Maybe we could, uh, if we get some uh, really visually appearing, appealing ones, we could pop them online and have a little, 100%. Have a little feature on our platforms. Yeah. A um, couple of great uh, encouraging comments here. Great talk, really helpful. Appreciate the suggested resources. Um, uh, found the UHN and Crumble logos, but not many are vector or scalable, scalable without getting blurry. Yeah, I, I have the vector ones. I'm happy to send the vector ones um, in a Illustrator file. I'll also send it into um, an EPS file, which you could open in other vector-based programs. Um, and I think the other one is SVG. Uh, I'll send an SVG as well, which is um, another vector file type that's scalable. 
Um, so just, I think, a couple more comments about requesting this brand guideline to get uh, sent around, but we'll make sure we do that for sure. Um, a suggestion that maybe the lab challenge could be sent around through the Office of Research Trainees. Okay. We have a comment from our vision researcher saying there are physiological, physical issues with using a white background. This can be discussed. Oh, not sure if there's more detail on that. Interesting. I'd love uh, to hear about that. Yeah. I don't know if you're available to speak to that, Michael, or if you want to pop something in the chat or we can follow up on that afterwards. Um, yeah, so just thanks. Very informative. Um, Karen, I see you're saying that you can't open an Illustrator. I'm not sure if you have Illustrator uh, on your computer or not. I think uh, regarding these documents, the brand guidelines are actually in PDF form. And I believe that Twain is looking to either export his slides into PDF or mm -hmm. converting them into a Word document. So that's it for the chat. Um, I'm not sure if there's anything else you'd like to include. Um, no, just honestly have fun with it. I know what I sort of laid out seemed like, you know, some hard and fast rules, but really be creative uh, as best you can. And maybe this is an opportunity to explore your own creativity and, and your own visual tastes and preferences and, you know, create something that you are truly passionate about, which is your research and, you know, have, have people, you know, ha have that to share with people and get other people excited about your, your research. So that's the ultimate goal with creating some of these infographics. Well, before we let everyone go, don't forget about our mug giveaway. Yes. <laughs> so I believe Amy is going to hop on here in a moment. She has uh, her daughter Ellie there with her. And I believe all of the names of the individuals who have uh, logged on here today have been placed into a hat or a box for draw. Oh, so this is my daughter Ellie. She just turned seven. She will be helping us decide who is going to be the lucky winner of a crumble mug, highly coveted crumble mug. So we have our trusty Lego box. I've got everybody's name on there. So Ellie, can you draw one of these sheets of paper for me? Can you, can you take one? Pick one? Okay. And then can you open it up and then show in the camera the name that's inside the sheet of paper? So the camera's right here. Okay. Here's the name, Gigi. Is Gigi here? She was here. I did see her. I think she must have. <laughs> oh, there she is. No, I still see her. Gigi, do you hear Yay. us? Nice. Nice job, Gigi. Thank you, Abby. Okay, well, don't forget, everybody, next week we have um, uh, the seminars on building and amplifying your Twitter profile. Uh, following that, the week after, Twain will talk about smartphone photography and tips for beginners and people who may be a little bit more advanced, but using it to your advantage in promoting your research. Um, the week after, we have Media Training 101, so tips on um, how to present your work for media. And uh, after that, we thought we would try something a little bit different, a wild card session where you can just bring your questions, your burning questions about public affairs and communications, and, uh, and, uh, and it basically ask us the questions that, that you wanna know. So all of that information is in the Outlook invite, but we'll be sending out reminder emails as well. And uh, of course your feedback is always welcome about these sessions, what we can do better, what kinds of topics you're interested in. That's it, have a great weekend. Thanks, Twain. Thanks guys.